All right, let's get started again. Let's talk about uh, proportion tests for for two proportions, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for two proportions again. Let's work through an example here. It'll be a fairly brief example, and I suppose I should put up more examples before we have exams, but uh, or find some way for you to have practice with this. But let's remember that first we always have to check assumptions. So the conditions or assumptions for a two-sample proportion test are extremely similar to those for uh, a one-sample proportion test, which in turn are very similar to the situation for checking assumptions and conditions for means. It's pretty much the same deal. So from the, for the sampling distribution to be nearly normal, you need that success-failure condition to be true in both samples independently. And then the independence condition needs to be true in both samples as well. So let's just check those as we go through an example here. The example that I dreamed up for you is an example of who is likely to, more likely to go to college, people with a history of depression or people without a history of depression. And let's say you tried to get 40 people in each group, but some people uh, dropped out or moved to their mom's house in California or something. And so you ended up with 37 in one of your groups. Very standard stuff. But I did this to demonstrate that you don't always need equal ends to make these things work. The null hypothesis is that the proportion of people going to college, and that's your dependent variable here, is going to college, yes or no, a very binary thing. Yes or no, I went to college, I didn't go to college. The null hypothesis is that the proportion in the population, not just these 40 and 37 people, but the you know, millions of people that this applies to, that the proportion of people with depression and without depression who go to college is the same. The alternative hypothesis, let's make it two-tailed, is that it is not the same. So who's more likely to go to college? Let's say that these are the data that we find, that p hat sub d, I'm saying that's p hat for the depressed, the depressed sample. Well, they're not depressed now, but people who have a history of at least one depressive episode, college students with a history of at least one depressive episode. Um, let's say 26 out of 40 of these in this amazingly random sample that we imagined went to college, which is a proportion of 0.65. So the, the high school students with no history of depression, let's say 18 of them went to college, so the proportion of the no depression group was 0.486. It certainly looks like the depression students are winning and uh, that, that they're more likely to go to college than the students without depression, but it's a small sample. Let's see what happens. It's not that small, but it's kind of small. So let's check the, su the success failure condition, which means you need at least 10 of each of the things, each of the possibilities of your binary data to happen in each of your samples. So let's look in the sample with the 40 high school students who did have a history of depression. 26 minutes of college, so that's greater than 10. That means that 14 did not go, and that is also greater than 10. Assuming I did that math right, I'm just so bad. So let's say that's satisfied. 37 high school students with no history of depression, 18 went to college, that's greater than 10. That means 19 didn't, that's also greater than 10. Satisfied. There you go. So that condition satisfied. In independence, there's no reason to suspect anything weird in sampling, though of course you would check. If you did the data collection yourself, you would know, but if you didn't and you were just being asked to analyze someone's data, you'd check and you'd ask. And you'd have them to describe their data collection procedures to you. And the sample is probably less than 10% of the population. There are far more than 400 or 700 or whatever um, students in the world that this could apply to. So there are millions and millions. So this is far less than 10% of the population. So your conditions are satisfied. It's okay to go ahead with this test. So we have um, the proportion from the, the group with a history of depression of 0.65 no depression, 0.486. So we can plug these in and find out our standard error here. We just plug the numbers in, all the numbers from group one, let's say that's the, the, the history of depression group, we'll call that group one for the formula, so we know where that goes in the formula. And then group two is no depression. We plug that stuff in there, reduce things, calculate, and if I did things right, we get a standard error of about 0.112. And then we need a critical Z value to test against. And this is going to be plus and minus 1.96 because we said alpha is 0.05 and we said it was a two-tailed test with the alternative hypothesis had a not equal in it, not a greater than or less than, but a not equal. <clears throat> so that gives us a two-tailed test and so it's always 1.96 here. So now we can calculate our uh, Z observed here, our Z of, I should, Z of P1 minus P2 is what that should be, but I was having you know, frustration using Microsoft's equation editor there. So we plug in the numbers there. We've got our standard error, which we calculated 0.112. 
and the difference between those two proportions divided by the standard error, 1.46. Oh, so close. Well, not that close. So we know that we needed a value that was either less than negative 1.96 or greater than 1.96, positive 1.96, in order to reject the null hypothesis. This is between the negative and the positive 1.96. It's in the middle of the curve. It's not in the rejection regions, not in the tails. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. So the evidence does not suggest that a history of depression is associated with the likelihood of attending college. And then in the parentheses you do the same thing that we did with Z tests before. Z equals, and you put your Z observed, not critical because that would be pointless. And then P is greater than 0.05. So let's make a couple of notes about the language of proportions tests. In statistics, the way we describe things has to be uh, tightly tied to the things we are describing so that our language is accurate. So when you're talking about a mean of numerical data, you might use terms like, well, the level of this in this group, or the amount of such and such, or the quantity of this, etc. There are many words we can use to describe a numerical value, um, just in general. But when you have binary data, or dichotomous data, and you're describing a proportion, your language has to be appropriate for binary and dichotomous data. So we can say proportion, we could say percentage, that's fine. The percentage of people who did blah, 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 and so and so. But frequently you'll also see this. The likelihood of, you know, getting A's on test was influenced by such and such, or the probability of such and such and such and such. These are two terms that will pop up, as well as perhaps some other synonyms that mean the same thing. And when those pop up, you know you're dealing with something that can either go one of two ways, but can't have any values in between those two ways. It's not a mean, it's not a quantity that has any... Um, continuous values or even three values. It's just got two values. It either happened or it didn't. And so you're talking about the probability of it happening or the probability or the likelihood of it being true. So keep an eye out for that kind of language because it indicates that people are using binary data and not numerical data. And on that I will end this lecture and move on to another one.